Well, hello and welcome back, everybody, to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. This is episode 178, uh, which is a lot, and I appreciate you all visiting me each and every week. Remember, if you have questions, email them to us at podcast at DanJohnUniversity.com. I'll be more than happy to answer each and every question, and I appreciate the, the real outpouring of questions and the support we've received on this podcast. So let's get started. Um, Wes has a question, and I wonder if I know who Wes is. A few weeks back, you and Pat Flynn went over a program to boost overhead pressing, where you discussed volume, frequency, accessory exercises, and other factors to increase the overhead press. Could you discuss the same ideas for a program meant to increase the Olympic squat snatch in a beginning Olympic lifter program? Well, uh, let's make sure we review. Now, um, okay, first, uh, and I learned this when I was young, uh, and I still think there's value to it. If you can clean and press your body weight and you can squat snatch or snatch your body weight just for one, I think that is a standard pretty much recognized by everybody everywhere that you're fairly strong. Um, it's, it's a weird standard, and I know a lot of people don't like it. Um, <laughs> mostly people who, it is interesting who doesn't like it. I'll, 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 I've seen a lot of comments online about those two standards, and it kind of makes me laugh in a way to look at them. It's like, well, just because you and your, 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 your bros can't do something, it doesn't mean you should just simply dismiss it. Uh, you know, when I watch the Olympics, I watch people do you know, all these triple axles and all these things off the diving board and I can't do it. It doesn't mean they're bad. It just means that I'm not very good at diving and ice skating. So if you can't clean and press your body weight and you can't snatch your body weight, uh, why don't you try to find out what you can do or, you know, learn the exercises. That's my belief. So increasing your pressing and uh, Wes does a nice job here. Um, the, the number one thing I think if you want to increase your, your especially your overhead press, is you do have to do it a lot. Um, it is strange to think about this, but I remember Dick Knottmeyer telling me, um, so the Olympic press uh, was discontinued in 1972. I started Olympic lifting in 1974. So even though I've done presses and I've pressed 300 at about a body weight of about maybe 220, 225, so... I pressed a 138 kilos at 100 kilos. I never really was a presser because it just wasn't part of the sport. But one of the things he emphasized all the time is that you have to press almost every single day. So back in the early 70s, late 60s, you would see programs, and I have them up there in Strength and Health, where people are pressing literally every single workout. Part of the reason was is that they kept allowing more and more tricks to the point that some American lifters anyway, could clean and press more than they could clean and jerk. Uh, you'll see that it meets quite a bit. Now, obviously, maybe because they miss clean and jerks and we only get the record of their opener, but still, it's fascinating to look at it. Uh, before they really started cheating on the press, um, it, it was a, a much different sport. Oscar State got sick before the meeting of the Olympic Lifting Committee, and his argument was to do add get rid of the military press and go to the bench press. So the Olympic lifts would be the bench press, the snatch, and the clean and jerk. And I still think there might be no other sport in the world if that's what they decided on. So let's get let's get started. So to increase your press, you gotta press. You gotta press more often than you think. So the frequency is gonna be quite high. Uh, if you want to increase your military press, I, I can't. I don't think you can do it once or twice a week. I think it has to be at least three, and probably if you toss in two more practice sessions, you could do it up to five days a week. And of course, back in the day, some people did it eight, eight or nine or ten times a week, which is just amazing. Um, when it comes to volume, I'm still a believer with the military press training that most people are going to get that Delorme range of. 15 to 30 reps is probably the best for most people most of the time. And that's five sets of five, three sets of eight, um, and, and, you know, five sets of three, which is a great workout, uh, often missed, uh, three sets of 10 and all the variations in between. But 
if you want to increase your press, you also have to follow the rule of six. So it could easily work out to something like this. And this is how I press 300 pounds. Uh, and I, I'm about to go against my own advice, but I was also doing other things too. Uh, I had a solid workout one day a week of clean and then eight presses. One clean, eight presses, rest a minute. One clean, eight presses, rest a minute. One clean, eight presses. It only took about five minutes, but I found it was really good. The other day of the week, I did the most boring training program in the world. I cleaned it, pressed it, added weight, clean, press, add weight, clean, press, add weight. But I had enough background to get away with that. So when it comes to things like reps and sets, you're going to have to blend the two the, the two big concepts. So you're going to probably want to have some kind of uh, 15 to 25, 30 rep workouts, the five sets of five, three sets of eight workouts. I would say probably twice a week for the bulk of the people listening. And then the rule of 10 workouts twice a week. That's where you do like maybe six heavy singles, five sets of two, something like that, three sets of three. Uh, when it comes to overhead pressing, um, at least in my experience, I have found the most value, value to be that six single kind of workout. We start with the weight, you add 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 weight um, uh, as you go through the pressing workout. That's my experience. Neither, if you did the three sets of eight with a minute rest twice a week and you did the six heavy singles twice a week, uh, the amount of time you would take to train on that is minimal. Uh, for extra, uh, auxiliary exercises, not a ton of them are as good as the military press by itself. Um, the thing that I learned from Dick Notmeyer the most was he really emphasized those little press outs that I really push a lot. So after you make your, your last rep, and even if it's a single, that's your last rep, you just stand there for a moment, rock top, and you just do these four to six inch press outs. I did so many of them as a youth that often when you see a video of me pressing, I don't always finish the rep because we just spent so much time. After every clean and jerk, he had me do that. So to build up my overhead strength, that's just a lot of work. So besides the actual practice of the press, I would say press outs in addition to the last rep of every set you do. Um, I liked it a lot. Uh, on those three sets of eight with a minute rest, if you decide to go that direction, be a little careful about burning yourself out in the first two sets with those press outs. I do think there's value in single arm pressing, um, uh, either just one one bell pressed or the seesaw family of presses. I think that, that if you're gonna do auxiliary exercises, I would say the single hand kettlebell press especially or the seesaw press. And I think I think I know of at least three or three variations of the seesaw press, but my favorite one is the one where you just kind of go like that. So. On auxiliaries, I don't know how much you're going to get. Uh, but then, of course, you also have to have a very good clean, and that turns you into an Olympic lifter, and and good luck on that. Um, is there value in having a body weight press? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, this morning I was I was in pressing. In fact, uh, I'm, I'm just in for my workout. I also had to shove a lot of snow. Uh, when you do a lot of presses, and today I did, uh, eight sets of pressing, um, <laughs> of eights actually, because I, I'm just coming off an Olympic lifting meet. And when I put the weight down after eight sets of eight, and the weights, the, the loads are very reasonable, uh, I just feel good. Uh, pressing, as I've noted on my videos about the half kneeling press, the standing press and the half kneeling press are probably the two most restorative upper body movements I do because when you do them, your entire body has to work. Now, I know that the bench press, I always say it's an upper body exercise, but honestly, we all know you have to have, you know, you have to be pinned down and you have to be, you, know, you have to have your structure. And if you call the squat a lower body exercise, I can, I can tell you're not using very much load, but when it comes to actual military pressing, your whole body has to be locked down and engaged. The other thing I like about the one hand half kneeling press and standing press is it really reminds me of, um, I think the book is right there, uh, Thomas Meyer's Anatomy Trains. 
Uh, I can't see it because of the angle. Yep, there's an anatomy trains right there. It, it just reminds you how your body is linked up as an X. So uh, when you come to something like getting your snatch up, um, snatch follows the same exact rules. I think if you're doing the barbell snatch, if, if you're first starting, uh, I did it three days a week because that's what my coach told me to do. Um, it, with easy strength for fat loss, with Olympic lifting, um, I snatched five days a week, clean and jerk five days a week, front squat five days a week. I don't go heavy or hard any single day, but I get a lot of volume. And the, the more practice you get with the snatch, I think the better it is. For auxiliary exercises for the snatch, my best success came from doing snatch grip deadlifts. Uh, the problem is I got my snatch grip deadlift. It's a real wide deadlift. And then when you finish each set, you I do shoulder shrugs. And of course, when I was shrugging, uh, Dick Notmeyer would always walk over, look me in the face and said, what do you mean you don't know? Because this means I don't know. He thought that was funny because he said it every single day for like seven years. Um, I like the snatch grip deadlift because it builds up that uh, security coming off the floor. Uh, if you're snatching 300, but your snatch grip deadlifting 450, 500, you're not afraid of that bar as it comes off the floor. The modern Romanian deadlift, I think, has value, especially I like the way I teach it with that slide technique where you push the butt back and you wiggle the toes to really uh, make the hamstrings uh, scream. I think that helps. High pulls, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, your mileage may vary. Um, I At first, I got a lot out of them, and then later, nothing. Um, it's a real interesting conversation in the world of Olympic lifting. Um, it almost seems like there's no middle. It's either we love them, we hate them. There, there's no there's no middle. Um, they have their value. What happens to a lot of us though, we end up having a snatch pull technique and then a different one for the snatch itself. Again, your, Wes, your mileage may vary on that. And of course, the overhead squat. Um, if you can overhead squat as much as you can, um, it really makes a difference. It's nice to see Phil Maffetone's new book, rec uh, you know, recommending the overhead squat. Um, we do a thing called the snatch complex here at West that might help you also. Uh, it's a complex, which means you take one bar and you don't put it on the ground. Um, let's just say you do fives. So it's five snatch grip RDLs, five snatch uh, hang snatches, five overhead squats, bring the bar down, five back squats, dump the bar off, rest and repeat. Eights are pretty good if you, if you need some like just real specific conditioning. Fives and threes are real good as you build up the load. I would recommend that snatch complex at least three days a week while you're learning it. And why don't you keep with eights in the early when you're learning it? Just to really, because the eights, those eight overhead squats and those followed by those eight back squats, that's going to do a lot of your mobility and your flexibility issues without having to, you know, <laughs> like we used to say, without the embarrassment of stretching. But now that's all changed. I hope that helped, Wes. That, that's a good question, and uh, uh, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Oh, we had a question from John. Uh, this 66-year-old would like to add the glute development to my simple workouts. What equipment do I need? A band and hip thrust or the whole Brett Contreras equipment? Um, so I think uh, the Brett Contreras uh, hip thrust bands are brilliant. And I think I've mentioned many times, there's a video online of me doing the perfect workout. Um, the, my road version is I do, I, I lay on my back, <clears throat> I drive my thumbs into the ground, sorry about that. Drive my thumbs into the ground because I don't want my shoulders like this on the ground, I want my shoulders open. And then we do 15 hip thrusts, pushing the band out, bring the butt down, 15 clamshells, 14 hip thrusts, 14 clamshells, 13, 13, 12, 12, 11, 11, all the way down to 1, 1. Uh, that will wake up your butt. You can also do them, if you wish, with mini bands. I don't like mini bands because they rip all the hair off my legs. Uh, it's not the most macho thing I've said in my entire life, but it's true. Um, 
but yeah, I'm a big fan, at least of the glute loop, uh, the Brett Contreras glute loop. Um, I also have his hip thrust machine and his hip thrust light, L-I-T-E machine. I also have his deficit deadlift. Uh, for years, I was just using kettlebells, but I had all these, <laughs> maybe Brett doesn't want me to say this, but I had all these junky 25 and 10s sitting around, all these odd size rusty garbagey weights that I had nothing to do. So I, I, I got the deficit deadlift uh, and I bought from Sornick some stackers. So I have a little deficit deadlift corner and I like that a lot. If you want to go all in, I I don't, if you have the finances to do it, John, <clears throat> pardon me, but at 66, it's kind of fun to see the first two questions. At 66, if you press all the variations vertically and you do the glute work, outside of tossing in a walk, I think you've nailed it. Uh, that's not bad. Anytime you can work your shoulders, triceps, and uh, glutes, now don't forget the harder you work your glutes, the harder you work your ab wall, you take care of most of the issues uh, someone you're in your age cohort needs. Yeah, I like the idea. Um, I have the I have the big hip thrust machine. I uh, uh, machine I use uh, Dynamax bands on it with a stretchy loop. You can look at my Instagram video to see how I set that up. And I also use the glute loop. So I've got the hip thrust machine, the glute loops on. I got the stretchy bands over, and then I have an additional uh, stretchy band that activates my ab wall. Um, you know, you do a set of twenty. If you like, for me, I use two two big bands. I go I go to I go to failure. Uh, so let's say 20 to 25 reps. I pull off the first band. I keep going until I just get this deep burn. I pull that off, and then I just do uh, uh, unbanded. Uh, and by then, my glutes are fried. Hop up. I do a deficit deadlift, uh, maybe set of 8 or 10. I don't really worry about the numbers. Really reaching that bell back towards my heels. So I'm really, you know, I'm, the hamstrings are kicking in to help the glutes. Step off of that do a quick set of eight to 10 on the goblet squat. <laughs> so my quads now are helping my glutes finish. And then uh, uh, you can either hang and do knee raises or I use the ab wheel after that to make sure that the ab wheel, because the harder you, to make the glutes work harder, you got to engage the abs. And I also think that's just a good uh, balancing thing there. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of these modern uh, glute, uh, machines, glute exercises. Um, his book is uh, right there, The Glute Lab. And if you're not sure what to do, um, just buy the book and uh, and lift it. It's 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 a it's a heavy book and it's it's a good book. I like it a lot. I hope that helps, John. It's a good question and I cannot emphasize enough to you to push those glutes. All right, thank you. Barney uh, uh, asks a question. He says this, in mid-September after your video on the five exercise kettlebell workout, I went out and bought uh, 35 pound and 50 pound kettlebells. In just under two months during the program, two or three times a week, which is great, I've dropped a few pounds, but more importantly, feel really good. Barney, you bring joy to my heart because that's what I want to hear. I want you to look good, feel good, move good, and practice English. Um, I was initially concerned that swings would be problematic for my low back, but that's not been the case. However, I can't say the same thing for the squats. Any suggestions for getting my hips to open up and increase the uh, range of motion, ROM, uh, in my ankles. It's at the bottom of the squat where I feel my low back around my SI joint uh, tightening up. I'm taking a week off to see if it will improve. I haven't done any damage, but I can feel it in a not so good way. Now, here, let's just, let's just say this real quick. First off, hats off Barney, because I'm very pleased that you follow the program and you, you start to move on. Now this issue with your back, I, 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 this, this, I have so many different programs I offer, 
But one of the things I talk about each and every day, and, and we have a video somewhere on this, is I call it my daily mobility warm-up. I just jump up and I hang. And all I do is hang. I love it when I say something as simple, I hang. And then like people ask me all these follow-up questions. I jump up on a bar and I hang. Well, are your shoulders retracted? No, I, I don't know. I'm hanging. What do you do with your, you know, what do you do with your leg biceps? I, I don't know. So hang for 30 seconds and then I sit at the bottom of a goblet squat for 30 seconds. And while I'm down there, I make little circles. I push my uh, knees out with my elbows. I make circles both directions. I wedge in. Sometimes I curl. And all I'm trying to do is lubricate that uh, the hips, the ankles, the knees, and the lower back. Uh, I'm going to need you a little bit of a favor. Uh, what I would like you to do for me, Barney, is send in a YouTube video to us, uh, and I will and make it private if you want, whatever you want to do, and I'll look at it and I'll comment on it on it later. Increasing the range of motion for squats, uh, the first barrier to run into is your DNA. You just might be uh, born not to squat. And this, some people are born to sprint, some people are born to squat, some people are born to play in the National Basketball Association, um, and some of us just aren't. So I'm worried uh, that maybe your, your DNA doesn't support deep squatting. Having said that, I have a drill called the goblet squat into the overhead squat drill. And every time I get someone to take that exercise seriously, this magical thing happens where all of a sudden they become very lubricated in their hips and, and, and their lower back, and all of a sudden they're good squatters. Uh, Barney, since you've only been doing this since September, I don't know if you could have had a lot of changes at the at the flexibility and mobility range. Um, we know that very quickly your nervous system adapts to weightlifting. We know very quickly that your, uh, well, kind of depends on, on your, but once those hormones kick in, your, your, your muscle mass changes. And as I've heard, that even the very nature of the muscles changes, in some cases more of a fast twitch, which I guess is good. In your case, you might not have given it enough time, uh, enough practice sessions to increase your range of motion while being supported by your structure. A um, couple of things I wish I knew, your age and your background, but let's send that video in and let's, let's talk about this more. Okay, uh, pretty simple question from Dan. Um, what are your thoughts on knee sleeves for squatting? Well, <laughs> Uh, back in 91, uh, I wore knee sleeves, ankle brace, elbow brace, wrist brace, a belt. Uh, I was just constantly rubbing those uh, heat creams on my body. I was icing up everything after I was done working out uh, because I was brutally overtraining, completely overtraining. So if you're a competitive squatter, I think you need to wear... Uh, those neat, whatever you can get away with with your federation, because it will help your squat number go up. Um, let me finish this whole question here. I have used them years ago when I was squatting much heavier than I am now, but always kind of looked at them as the wrist straps of squatting, meaning that they were most like just masking imbalances elsewhere, including overtraining. So I quickly got away from them. After a few recent squat workouts that made the knees bark a little bit, no real pain, just aggravation, I started to entertain the thoughts of throwing them on again, but I have a fear that I might become reliant on them. What are your thoughts? So my thoughts are this. Dan, I, I respect the fact that you, you squat. I am concerned that unless you're competing, you know, banging up your knees uh, it isn't probably a great idea. Uh, or even if you are competing, it's probably not a good idea. So uh, what I would be interested in is you would give yourself a, maybe a couple week assignment. Um, get like, you can either do this with uh, suspension trainers or you can just do it with a doorknob. In fact, we call it the doorknob drill, even when I use the suspension trainer. But you lay your weight back and you squat. Do a couple sets of 10, three sets of 10 th the first week 
you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then assess, does that hurt my uh, knee? If that doesn't hurt your knee, then okay. Uh, now, if it does hurt your knee, we clearly, maybe we got to look at another uh, exercise for you to, to deal with, because maybe you, just not, you shouldn't squat. Then the next week, go to the goblet squat. Again, three to five sets to 10, don't, don't work real hard. And uh, see how that feels. The third week, do that goblet squat to overhead squat drill that I show, where you drop down the goblet squat, you pick up the stick, stand up, squat back down, put the stick down, curl the bell back up, stand up, squat, you know, and just keep going. After the end of those three weeks, then I want you to think, then I want you to go back and do what you were doing before. And because if it's a technical issue, then that's, then that's something we can fix. Uh, if you're doing certain variations of back squatting, for example, uh, which some of them I don't like, um, very often people's knees hurt because the variation of the squat, the back squat they're doing just is, is, is beating them up. And again, if you're not competing, I mean, who cares if you squat 200 pounds in a workout versus 800 pounds, as long as you feel good and move good. Um, so at the end of those three weeks, if your knees aren't barking or it's real manageable, then maybe it's just the variation you used. After those three weeks, if your squats don't hurt, but you still want to squat, I would... I would even suggest that you go to the knee sleeves, but go into the knee sleeves uh, a little bit slowly and with some insight and thought to it. Okay, go go into the go into adding them back with at least a little self experimentation first, because if it is a technical issue, the knee sleeves are just going to be uh, yeah, it would be pro. I mean, they're prophylactic. I mean, they're they're just they're, they're stopping something. Um, but what I'd like you to, what I'd like you to do is make sure your technique is, you know, is, is, you know, lock solid, rock solid, I'm sorry. And, uh, and then see if you need it or not. Okay. That's a good question. And I, and I hope it works out for you. We got a question from Jeremy. I recently completed your squat 101 program. That's amazing. Very few people have done it. And everybody who's done it has uh, really made good progress. It's in the book, Mass Made Simple. It's also available on Dan John University. And he completed Mass Made Simple. They made for a great 12 weeks of training. Damn, that's a lot of squatting. I enjoyed the challenge and honestly not having to plan my own lifting. What do you recommend next? I'm 45 years old and usually do sprint, sprints track training, but often omit the lifting due to time constraints or simply prioritizing the running. I would like to get back to competition eventually as well. You know, this is why we have the inner circle, uh, Jeremy. Uh, so the inner circle, I think it's, uh, I know for sure on the YouTube, no, on the Instagram tag, it's there. I'm sure it's on the YouTube tag. And if you can't find it, just go to DJU and let us know. And we'll, we'll. But one of the things we do in the inner circles, we have this conversation with other people listening to you. Uh, most people want to do programs. We don't have to think about it, which is why I think the workout generator there is so good for most people. Uh, you plug in the equipment you have, you, how many days a week, how long, how hard, you press the button and it kicks out, uh, how, if you said three days a week, a three day a week program, five day a week program, six day a week program, one or two day a week program. And, it's, and it tells you to do this. Jeremy, if you're a sprinter, there is a value um, at 45, especially, you want to push, you want to pull, you want to hinge, you want to squat, and you want to load a carry, you want to go for walks, and um, you, you want to do it all, and you need to. Tossing the sprinting in, I think if you could do the workout generator two to three times a week, and then you know keep your sprinting up, I think you're going to be extremely happy 10 years from now when you turn the corner at 55, where things do change. Things change hard at 55. Um, this isn't this isn't just me pontificating. It's, you know, uh, if you do your research, you'll notice that that's when, and this is the German studies of the 40s, that's when it for, we first start to dip 
in terms of strength. Now, of course, with you coming in uh, as, with your lifting background, with your, your high school classmates, you're going to dip here and you'll probably be at the same strength levels as a typical 20-year-old. So I, I, I salute it. So what I am telling you is I would love to see you do the workout generator and I'd love to see you keep your sprinting up. Um, if you want to be a sprinter, uh, I would recommend, now at your age and since you're not elite, but I'm still going to tell you what I recommend. I'm not a big believer in varying exercises for sprinters because I don't want sprinters to get sore. Uh, Barry Ross, of course, had his athletes drop deadlifts. If they did a set of five and a deadlift, they would drop every single rep because he felt that the eccentric part of that movement caused the soreness. Um, and that's why if you're not squatting uh, as a sprinter, I'm fine with, I mean, I still like the movement of squatting. So like goblet squats or something like that, it would be great. But you don't have to go too hard. You need, you know, you need, and this is Percy Saruti said the same thing and a lot of great other sprint coaches I've heard. You need to do some kind of push, pull, hinge, and squat. But you need to make sure you can come back in two days and do it again. And that none of your weight workouts interfere with your sprint workouts. Um, if you combine the workout generator with a sprint, training. I, I don't know. Honestly, I'm just, I'm almost envious of you, you know, uh, because that's almost, you know, like, it's almost perfect. Okay. Uh, oh, um, we just went through another group on the uh, inner circle. We're starting up another group. So it won't be, uh, I won't be available for that for a couple months. But I think, yeah, I, there's the email right there. Oh. Uh, DanJohnInnerCircle.com if you want to apply. Um, but uh, if you do the workout generating a sprint, yeah, I don't know what else I could tell you. Yeah, you know, eat vegetables, uh, drink water, get your sleep, and, you know, be a nice person, I guess. Good question. I've got a question from Matthias, okay? I hear, I hear you are a proponent of intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating. Oh, is this on some corner? Someone come by? Psst, Dan John's in the intermittent fasting. I have tried fasting every day until one for a long time now. Though it works well for me in many ways, I like to work out, lift weights early in the morning. That is while fasting. I have always heard that you ought to eat protein within 20 to 30 minutes after completing training. What are your thoughts on that? Can I do heavy lifting during my fasting window and still see results? Yeah. Uh, so welcome, welcome to the problem. I mean, during my the bulk of my career, uh, we had workouts at three o'clock in the afternoon. That's very common in uh, the United States. It's after high school, it's in college, it's an easy time to schedule things. My practices at Utah State were at 1.30 in the afternoon, which which I liked a lot. Uh, if you're training at 3 in the afternoon, I don't, I'm not sure intermittent fasting is a good choice. Now, obviously, there's good, if you, you're trying to lose fat or you're getting ready for a wedding, then the rules change, and I get that. But if you're, if you're going to train like American football at 3 in the afternoon in typical high school, I would expect you to eat breakfast and lunch and maybe even a snack before you go into training. When we do uh, the easy strength for fat loss programs, we kind of edge towards, basically it comes down to that you're skipping breakfast and then you're eating after you lift and walk. Um, is there something terrible that's going to happen if you don't eat protein, you know, the I, I, it's interesting to listen. I mean, I can remember when I first went online. I mean, if you didn't wake up and have a protein shake, there was something wrong with you. There were, uh, you're crazy. you got to have protein the moment, the second you wake up. And by the way, if you read Mass Made Simple, I recommend that for a week to test it out if that can work for you. I mean, I know, I mean, I've had my athletes. 
uh, drink a, a very watery protein shake just before they go to bed. So that in a few hours they have to wake up and want to go pee. And when they go pee, they drink another protein shake that they already had ready. And when they wake up in the morning, they drink a protein shake. So they're doing three protein shakes in about a nine hour window because we're trying to bulk them up and get them ready to throw the shot for our play American football. So can you exercise and then continue the fast? I know a lot of people who do it. When I read the book, uh, the works of like Kino Body and Rusty Moore and some of the others, that's not uncommon advice uh, in, in their books um, to, to keep that fast going after a workout. Um, if, if you're like me, one of the things I don't need to worry about very much is enough protein. Um, you know, it's, it's a rare meal. Uh, every meal I have, I eat, has fermented food, uh, a, a, an assortment of vegetables, but usually two protein sources. Uh, I just had breakfast just before this, well, whatever you want to call it, lunch, I guess, uh, whatever. After my workout, you know, an hour later, I ate whatever that meal is, brunch, I guess, okay. And I had salmon and eggs. And so I probably eat uh, salmon and eggs. Uh, usually scrambled eggs today was over easy. And just a small amount. Um, at most, this much lox and salmon, uh, you know, but they're flat, so it would easily fit in my hand. So I eat pro probably four different protein sources a day. And I still uh, occasionally I'll, I'll down that protein shake uh, especially when I find, if I see my body weight starting to edge up out of nowhere, very strange, and this might just be me, but I'll drink a protein shake, and it's weird because sometimes, and maybe it's a satiation of a protein drink, but I'll notice after two or three days of drinking a single protein shake in a day that my scale weight goes down, which I don't completely understand. Um, so yeah, if you read the course on danjohnuniversity.com, You'll notice that, you know, we're, yeah. so eat your evening meal, you know, drink your water, drink your ginger tea, drink your whatever, drink your, you know, non-caffeinated hot beverages. Get up in the morning, pound down as much coffee as you can, uh, do whatever you got to do, get that workout in, and then eat. And then if you do have a narrow window, Matthias, of, I don't know, seven or eight hours, I still think that's fine. I think it's, uh, and, I, and I, I'm pretty sure you can get your protein numbers up without having to go too crazy. Uh, I feel like my answer is all over the place, but then again, this question sort of is, not your question, but the concept of protein, intermittent fasting, diet. I don't think we've completely settled on what works perfectly yet, and, and I kind of doubt we ever will. All right, thank you. So we got a question from Eric. My question is about the Lean Made Simple program by Slade Jones. Okay, Slade wrote a program for us. It's up there on, the, it's in the download section of danjohnuniversity.com. It's a nice program based on the same principles as Mass Made Simple, um, but focused on leaning out. I found the program on DJU and also read Slade's book. I am three quarters through the program and really enjoying it as a bus bench break from my park bench type workouts. I think I've listened to almost all your podcasts and I don't remember you talking about the program. Have you done it? Dan John has not done it. I've done something similar and Slade and I uh, had a great conversation. Um, uh, in full candor, Eric, uh, the idea was to replace goblet squats for the high rep back squats in the um, in the Mass Made Simple program. So we basically tried Mass Made Simple with much lighter squats, kept the complexes. Uh, we swapped out uh, bench press for military press because we all kind of wanted to do that instead. And, um, and I think you'll notice a lot of Slade's program fits that. And since we weren't force feeding ourselves, uh, uh, we, we did well. Um, I think it was timing that didn't, it was a very wet, wet, snowy winter. And uh, a lot of us were all, like today, you know, I was out 
shoveling snow six times in the last two days. Shoveling snow and doing high rep squats at the same time. Uh, is I, I'm not sure that's a good combination, okay? So uh, park bench, bus bench, real quick for those you don't know. Years ago, my boss, the, the late Archbishop George Niederauer, wrote an article, and he had written many on this same topic, called Bus Bench Prayers versus Park Bench Prayers. And the idea is there are certain times you pray and you want something. You know, uh, I don't, my mom has cancer, please get her cured. And there's other times where one would pray or commune or meditate where you're really not asking anything. Um, you take a bus bench, you put it in front of a bus stop, you expect a bus to come. Take that same bench, put it 60 feet back into a park, you expect nothing in a park bench. Uh, squirrel comes by, great. If squirrel doesn't come by, that's great too. So I took that concept and I ran it into this idea. Certain times of the year we want to train with specific goals. Like if you're going to do a really hard diet and you follow it, for me, it'd be the velocity diet, the old one, you know, just six protein shakes a day for 28 days. That's so hard. At the end of it, man, you'd better look better because <laughs> that's so hard to do. Uh, that's a classic bus bench program. Certain peaking programs are classic bus bench uh, training programs. Park bench is what I do most of the time. I just go in the gym, kind of like I did today. Today was, a, I'm coming off a weight Olympic lifting meet, so today I did presses, chins, and curls, you know. Uh, I I think I did a lot of sets of presses. I'm pretty sure it was eight sets of eight. I did a set of chins after every one uh, of those, and then I did some curls because there was a bar sitting there. That's all I could think of doing, and I didn't want to do anything else because I had been shoveling snow. So that is a classic park bench workout. Um <laughs> I'm not going to sit down and say, yes, this is what I'll do for six months and then I'll be Mr. Olympia. Uh, it's just a good program. It's fun to do. Um, this is the one thing that may annoy you or may make you happy is that no matter what I hear or get into or any book I read, I always find some a clue in there that'll make me a better coach, a better athlete, or whatever. It's funny as I say that, I just looked down here. I was rereading my first public ar published article the other day, A New Look at the Beowulf Poet. It's my first published article. Um, and I, I even look at it now and go, I use the concepts to talk about diet and exercise. So, so yeah, I, I think you'll... I, I, I haven't done Slade's program, and I'm, but I've done something very similar. And what hurt me doing it, of course, was the hard, the hard snowstorms. And I think I just got, I just shoveling snow. And even if you have, I mean, I have all the stuff, but it's still hard work when you're in the middle of snow season. Lean made simple. If I could do it again, I would do it probably in July. Okay. Good question. And thank you. Kevin asked this. I was intrigued by this quote, being one piece is the real gift of the Olympic lifts. Um, I was wondering if you had any recommendations for exercise other than the Olympic lifts and overhead squat that would instinctively teach a lifter to, to, to keep the body as one piece. Now, for reference, okay, here it is right here. The phrase, the body is one piece, comes from this book here. This is probably the third edition that I've bought. The book is called Staying Supple by John Jerome. And uh, somewhere in, the, in America, somebody has my borrowed copy. And on the back page here is my uh, lineups that I was putting together on a plane flight for my offense and defense uh, in 1991. So, uh, that, so I've had these books for a long time. Uh, John Jerome was a wonderful author. His other book, Staying With It, is just amazing. And this is where the phrase, um, the body's one piece, comes from. So I, I like the idea here, you know, here's the thing. If you clean and press body weight, someone's going to say, what muscle does that work? Well, the truth is it works every muscle in the system. As you may know, I'm against the idea of there's 600 muscles in the body. I'm moving away from that. I'm now saying there's one muscle subdivided into 600 parts. Uh, we have one nervous system. And for some reason we think we have. Now I know those of you from the bodybuilding world, you're going to disagree with that. And I'm fine. 
Uh, I used to, when I was a Highland Game athlete, and the bodybuilder guy would show up with his girlfriend, and he'd be, well, you know, walk around with this. You know, I don't know why they do this. They cut the sleeves off the shirt, and they, then they roll them up like this. Those guys were terrible. Terrible when it came to the Highland Games. Terrible. Uh, I used to play in a, I was in adult football leagues until my late 40s. And I always loved it when they put a guy with, obviously, who trained with curls and tricep extensions to cover me. Because I knew it would be a very long day for them because they weren't training the body as one piece. So the classic Olympic lifts. So the clean and press, the snatch, and the clean and jerk, those are your winners. I do think the overhead squat and the front squat, I would argue those are both the same. I would say that, uh, interesting, I think that the suitcase carry teaches that. The farmer walk, as much as I like it, the fact that you have weights in both hands kind of even things out a little bit too much. Uh, again, you know, I could be wrong on all this, but uh, those would be the big ones. So the Olympic lifts, uh, the front and overhead squat, uh, the suitcase carrier. So when you come and, and, and see how, the way I train my athletes, very often you'll see um, huh, that fact I just, that's what uh, Emily's workouts are. She snatches, she front squats, and she does suitcase carries. And I, I think there's real value to that. It keeps you uh, in one piece, which is what you need to be a thrower. You can't be a collection of body parts. Well, that's that's it. Th that's all the questions we have today. Um, those were good. Um, another episode behind us. Remember, if you have questions, podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, I enjoyed these questions. I Today was nice. Um, each week I sit down and I answer them. I do answer a lot of emails too. Sometimes I'll just... It's a little bit, if the question is a little bit very specific, I'll just send off an email. But uh, every week we do this, and until next week, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you very much.